Today's epistle reading is Hebrews, chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is bound to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Stand, please, for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is from Mark chapter 10, beginning with the 35th verse. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I, with, with which I am baptized? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So once in a while, about this time of year, uh, it will be during a home Panthers game, my phone in my pocket will begin to buzz with text messages and emails from people like you. And the reason you're contacting me is you have seen me on the Jumbotron. And the reason I'm on the Jumbotron is I'm sitting in arguably the best seat in the house. And you're calling saying, that must be so cool. And I realize that when you see me on the Jumbotron, that I soar in your estimation. I soar a little in my own estimation. <laughs> I think of people that I have good seats that I've had over time, people I've sat next to. One time I was at a dinner and I was seated next to David Brooks, the New York Times columnist. Amazing. Another time at lunch, I'm sitting next to President Jimmy Carter. Now this is one of those things of, what do you talk about when you're with a famous person, right? What do you say to Jimmy Carter like, hey, how was the Oval Office? Or, you know, they say, what do you make, how do you make small talk with somebody like that? One time at a fundraiser, uh, I was sitting at the head table, and I was sitting next to Henry Aaron. And I was, I was like, you were one of my heroes when I was a little kid. And, and I, I shook his hand. Oh, he's got a big, strong hand. <laughs> and I patted him on the arm, and it felt like a sack of concrete. <laughs> like, that's how you hit all those home runs. Okay, good. Henry Aaron. Here's a cool thing. Uh, when I was a student at Duke, I had, through an odd set of circumstances, come to be acquainted with Roy Williams. And at that time, Roy Williams wasn't Roy Williams yet. He was nobody. He was like the last assistant on the end of Dean Smith's bench. So when Carolina would come to play at Duke, I would leave my seat, and I would go, this during warm-ups, I'd go down, and I would sit next to Roy Williams on the bench and catch up. My friends would look down like, you're sitting with the enemy. But now I can say, I was sitting with Roy Williams. It's pretty cool. I don't think about the great seats that I've had. I scored row three seats to hear Paul McCartney here in Charlotte. I've had front row seats at Broadway shows. I've sat in the president's box at football games at Wallace Wade Stadium, which to some of you wouldn't be all that enviable. <laughs> but I have been there. And you could argue that all of these things in some way are a measure of success. I've had some pretty cool seats, you could say, that guy's done well in the world. 
Zebedee, in the passage that we've heard, is a man who lives in a place called Bethsaida. He has two sons, James and John. And if you ever go with me to Israel, I will take you to Bethsaida. Archaeologists have dug it up. And in the time of Jesus, this is really interesting. The fishing industry was booming around the Sea of Galilee. These were upwardly mobile people making the best of the world. We tend to think fishermen is not a big deal. But in those days, that, that was like a good business. And I imagine that Zebedee had high ambitions for his sons, James and John. And he had to be a little worried when they put the fishing nets down one day and went traipsing off after this guy named Jesus. But yet at the same time, Zebedee may have been proud because in those days, Jesus was, he was a grand celebrity and everybody was traipsing around after him. They thought that Jesus would overthrow the Romans and would restore the might of the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. So this is great, and James and John are part of this thing. And they're not just followers of Jesus. They're not even just in his inner 12. They're in the inner three of the inner 12. You can tell this in the windows here. We have Peter, James, and John. Those are like the people that were, you're going to be looking at these windows the rest of the service. Like, who are <laughs> Peter, James, and John. These are the three of the disciples that are Jesus' inner circle. So Zebedee probably thought, my sons are doing pretty well at this thing. And the sons pick up on the ambition because they come to Jesus one day and they say, when you come into your glory, we want one of us on your right hand and one of us on your left hand. And Jesus must have just sighed and said, you just so don't get what I'm about. What Jesus was about wasn't that kind of thing that makes it onto jumbotrons or anything else. What Jesus was about, and maybe this could be explained by another person that I got to sit next to. This was amazing. Ely Wiesel, right? The Auschwitz survivor, famous. He was in Charlotte to give a talk. I signed up to go to a lunch where he was, and somehow when the seating arrangement came out, I'm sitting next to Ely Wiesel. I was excited for about a minute, but then I had that same small talk question, right? Which is, what do you say to Ely Wiesel? Right? Do you say, hey, I enjoyed reading Night? You know, that's just not very good because it's a book about the horrors of the Holocaust. What, how do you make small talk to somebody that survived Auschwitz? It's Ely Wiesel. In that book, Night, there's a really amazing scene. It was one of the worst nights for the Nazis just being gruesome, just being gruesome to the Jews they held captive in Auschwitz. So they took a child, and right in front of the crowd, they hanged that child and left the child dangling there. Wiesel said he heard a voice say, where is God now? And the answer that came was, God is there hanging on the gallows. When we first hear that, we think it means, well, God is dead. But what's interesting is that Eli Wiesel, this is amazing to me. You and I find all kinds of trivial reasons to have doubts about God. Ely Wiesel survived Auschwitz. I mean, if anybody had cause to give up on God, it would be somebody who lived in Auschwitz. Yet Ely Wiesel believes in God. But he believes in a sober kind of God, not the kind of God that turns your nickels into dimes and makes your gardens grow, but the kind of God who knows what suffering is about and can be one with us and everyone in our suffering. It's in that passage that Bill read, praises Jesus and talks about why he's able to help us. And the reason that he's able to help us is that he can sympathize with us in our weakness. And he remembers that night in Gethsemane. The phrase that it uses is, on that night, Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. Loud cries and tears. What was this God about in the Garden of Gethsemane? When Jesus Christ Superstar came out in the early 70s, I didn't get to see the Broadway show back then, but I saw the movie that came out in the early 70s. I would commend this movie to you. It's, it's very hippie 70s Jesus, but I love it. And the Garden of Gethsemane scene is especially interesting because when the movie came out, it was very controversial. Pious Christians said, Jesus is being misrepresented here. Oh, no, we can't have this. And they were protesting the movie and so on. And I would beg to differ. I think the movie captures very well what Jesus was about because Jesus and Jesus Christ Superstar in the Garden of Gethsemane sings these lines where he says things like, I'm not as sure 
Father, as when we started. Once I was inspired, but now I'm sad and tired. God, if I could just see a little part of your omnipresent brain, why should I die? He's expressing doubt. He's not understanding. There seems to be distance between God, the Father, and Jesus. But this makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? I mean, Hebrews even says this. Hebrews says, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. That Jesus grew into God. That Jesus learned about his destiny over time. That he was not omniscient, but that he struggled to understand what God was calling him to do. And what God was calling him to do was extremely difficult. And he did not want to do it. He did do it, but it was a struggle. He had to grow. He had to learn. This seems fitting because this is the case for you and me. We have to struggle. We have to learn. God asks us hard things, and we prefer not to hear that or do that. Hebrews says that Jesus grew into God through what he suffered. And I would suggest to you, in light of the passages today, that maybe we grow into God by what we suffer, or maybe we grow into God by where we sit. So I've sat some cool places, I've already told you about it, but I want to tell you about some better places where I've sat, and I don't know if I will soar in your estimation after this. I think it's not soaring, I think it's coming down somehow. I was in Haiti a while back. We have a group right now that's in Haiti, uh, and I hope they're having a good time. We'll be hearing back from them this week, how they're doing. I remember several years ago, sitting under a banyan tree in the schoolyard there in Bayonne, Haiti. I was sitting under the tree in the dirt with this little boy. He was three or four years old, I forget. He'd been very ill. We weren't sure that he would survive, but but he'd made it. And we were just sitting there on the ground, and his name was James Smart. And the Haitians loved this, by the way. They'd walk by and they'd say, he's James Smart. You are James Not Smart. (laughs) I would say, that's just so true. And I'm just sitting on the ground with James Smart. What a, what a privilege. What an honor. And there's no jumbotron there. There's no electricity there. There's no internet there. Nobody sees it. Nobody texts me to congratulate me for sitting on the ground with James Smart. But what a cool seat. I've gotten to know so many amazing people and I've gotten to sit in so many amazing places in my life. One, I've told a few of you this story before, but it bears repeating. I'd gone on a mission trip to Lithuania a few years ago. We were in the town of Birjai. And uh, there's a woman there who is just the most amazing woman I've ever met. With all due respect for the many fine women who are in this room right now, uh, Regina outdoes you any day. She, she was just a, she was so amazing. See, she grew up as a, as, a, as a she grew up in a communist country, so she grew up as an atheist. I mean, nobody went to church or did anything. She didn't know anybody who believed in God. And then when she was about 40. She, she met some women at a church, and they sewed together and did some things. So she started reading her Bible, and she thought, oh, this is true. <laughs> and she became a Christian, and she started doing amazing things. Because if you saw where Regina lives, you would count her as ridiculously poor. Nobody in Charlotte is as poor as Regina. But in her view, she wasn't poor because she would save what money she could to go out and help the people that she regarded as poor. This is always interesting, Right. <laughs> the people that the poor regard as poor. So she would go out to this, it's called the Villages. It was out from the city of Birger, and the people there lived in, you know, ramshackle, it's just un, unspeakable conditions that people lived in there. She said that she was going out there one day, and I said, can I go with you? And she said, yeah. So we, we went to the grocery store, spent your money, bought food. <laughs> Thank you very much for the people in the Villages. And they were riding out there, and Regina's driving, and she is just the worst driver. You know, she's just like, she's kind of going along, she keeps kind of running off the road, I'm just like hanging on for dear life. She finally, like, she pitched the thing into a ditch, and we had to get some help, and pull the thing out, and her exasperation, she looked at me and said, would you drive? And I said, yes, please, (laughs) please let me drive. So I drove the rest of the way, and we go to this woman's house, is not the right word, just lean to shack terrible place. And on the way, Regina told me that she'd been working with this woman for a long time. She was a young mom, had three children. She had a new boyfriend. And Regina did not approve of this boyfriend because he drank too much and he was mean to her. She said, I'm going to talk to her about the boyfriend. So we got there. And this is so cool. We sat in the kitchen at a table. We, we put the food out and 
And, and then Regina began to talk to the young mom. And I don't know, she's talking to Lithuania. I don't know what she's saying, but she's, she's just giving her what for. Now, I assume she's lecturing her about this boyfriend. And then she stops and she says, let us pray. We joined hands. And Regina prayed, I mean, a long time. So it was over, we got in the car, we left. I said, Ray, what, what, what were you praying all that time? I'm sure God understood the Lithuanian, but I did not. <laughs> and she said, well, I prayed for you and thanked you for your church and so on. And I prayed for her. She said, I, I called down a curse on this boyfriend. <laughs> he was a goner after this. And I, I've thought about that. I, I mean, there are, what a privilege, right? There I was in the middle of nowhere in this just not even a shack with a young mom and this amazing woman. And I, I got to sit there. I, that was amazing. That was amazing. This is if you go to the men's shelter. Now, I'll just say the men's shelter has asked me and some other people to raise money for their capital campaign. Before I come ask you, just call me. Tell me that you'll give me the money. That'll save me a lot of time and trouble. Thank you in advance for that. If you ever go to the men's shelter and you sit down and talk to men who live in the men's shelter, it disabuses you of whatever notions you have had about why people are homeless. It happens every time. Inevitably, it's something like this. You sit next to someone and you start talking. Half the time, it's somebody who's a military veteran. Like it's somebody who went off and fought for our country. And our country has terrible programs for soldiers that have suffered trauma. So they come home and they're not making it and then they're at the men's shelter. And I've sat there so many times and thought, I, what a privilege for me to get to sit here with this guy who's telling me a story who's struggling so much. I think about St. Francis of Assisi, G.K. Chesterton wrote a reflection on Francis's life and he said this, he said, Francis liked everybody but he especially liked those whom others disliked him for liking. I, I like that. Is there anybody, for God's sake, that you like and somebody else dislikes you for liking that person? And I thought about other great seats of honor that I've enjoyed in my life. See, this is the week that I have, have a big birthday coming. It's one of those that has a zero on the end, and it's humiliating. I don't really want to talk about it, so don't bring it up. But when you approach such a birthday, you think back on your life and what you're grateful for. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not, when I think about what's been a blessing in my life, I don't think about it. I've been on the Jumbotron at Bank of America Stadium, or even I sat next to Jimmy Carter or Hank Aaron or Roy Williams. I think about other seats that it's been such a privilege to occupy. I remember when my children were little, I loved, that's just an understatement. I loved every night, every night, at bedtime, crawling into bed with my children, and we'd just read. Like, I'd give, all, I'd give my pension up to be able to go back and do that again. And you may feel the same way, and actually we offer something like this to you. We have, we have tutoring programs, and you can go actually read to a child, even if your children are grown. And you may think, well, that's not, that's not the same. That's not really helpful, but it can really matter. So you had something interesting that happened. Uh, there was a little boy years ago that I read to. His name was Drexler. I read to him in kindergarten, first and second grade, and read with him every week, and sometimes in between, we had him to our house a few times. Lovely, lovely boy. But then we kind of lost track of him. He left the family he was staying with here, and he went to an aunt or somebody down in South Carolina. I just lost track of him, kind of feared the worst. But then somehow, I came back in contact with him. This is amazing to me. I encounter him, and like, there he is, and he's a senior in high school, and he's getting ready to go to college. And part of me is thinking, like, hey, I read to him. So I said to him, I said, I used to read to you. Do, do you remember me? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but how cool. See, what a privilege it had been for me. Week after week, I got to sit with old Drexler and read. Now he's good against all odds going to college. What about all these seats that we get to occupy? I think about my grandfather. I get sentimental about them, but it's meant so much to me. And I think about things. I've told you this before, but it really matters. It's the kind of thing that you're grateful for. 
my grandfather was a, he was a, a faith healer. He was a faith healer. I, nobody called him that. He was a Southern Baptist deacon, and he sang in the choir of the church. And a lot of times when the pastor was preaching, I'd look up, and my grandfather would be asleep. <laughs> I think they're with me here. He'd be asleep in the choir, but he was a faith healer. What would happen, I mean, most famously, I remember we would get the hiccups, and everybody would say, you get a bag, and you blow, and you put sugar under your tongue. Whatever the cures are, for it, hold your breath. Baba Howell would say, I've got this. So he would take me, and he would sit me on his lap, and, uh, with, facing my back, and he would tap out with his knuckles this pattern on my back. He would do this, and it cured the hiccups. And I know that this works, because when my children came along and got the hiccups, Lisa would say, get the bag, put the sugar, I'd say, no, I've got this. And I would put them on my lap, and I would tap out this pattern, and it would cure their hiccups. I hope they will do this with their children when the time comes. What a privilege for me. Like, I got to sit on my grandfather's lap. He was nobody. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he never went to a day of college. We don't think he ever traveled out of the Carolinas. But I got to sit there. I mean, what a privilege. What a privilege. Maybe you have at some point sat at the bedside of someone you love who's dying. And if you've done this, you know that there is no more noble seat. And nobody texts you to congratulate you. You don't get up on a jumbotron, but it's the seat of honor. It's the seat of honor. And I want to suggest one last one to you. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of funny. I was thinking about one other seat. I, uh, the choir's heard this three times. I have to throw in something new, so I'll throw in this. When I was at Duke, uh, I studied under a guy named Roland Murphy. He was a great Bible scholar. And I remember while I was there, he was named to this prestigious chair at Duke University, the George Washington Ivy Chair. And so I went by to, I didn't know how these things work. I went by to congratulate him. So I walked to his office. He said, have a seat. I sat down and I said, congratulations on this George Washington Ivy chair. That's just such a huge deal. I'm just proud to know you. And I, he said, yeah. I said, is, is, let me ask, is there actually a chair? He said, yeah, there's really a chair. I said, where is it? He said, you're sitting in it. <laughs> there's a seat of honor and you're sitting in it. These pews are seats of honor. Not because it's Myers Park. Any church, the little country church I served when I got out of seminary, the little churches you drive by when you're up in the mountains, little white A-frame churches, all those churches have seats of honor. You can't sit anywhere better because when you sit here, you're part of this family of God. You're one of the ones that Jesus loves and has compassion for. You're part of these people who have this project that turns the world upside down. It's not about jumbotrons and prestige and big names. It's about humility. It's about service. It's about love. It's about being near those who are hurting. It's about so much gratitude for so many small and humble gifts. God's goodness, God's goodness, the seat of honor. We all get to sit in it. Thanks be to God.
Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.